Warriors are soft-skinned, but hopelessly aggressive. They record... Hello, I'm Roger Mudd. Welcome to the History Channel. 500 years ago, the Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian I bought a suit of armor at a cost of 26 cows. That's the equivalent of about $350,000 in today's money. More recently, an American collector paid $3 million for a suit of armor made for King Henry II. Our program is the story of the armor worn by medieval knights in Europe and samurai warriors in Japan. The artisans who created the armor had to undergo long apprenticeships and pass tough exams before earning the title of master. Their products were the only thing separating a soldier from the slings and arrows of his enemies. Join us now as the History Channel presents Arms in Action, Mail and Plate Armor. And essentially the rule is like this. You don't wear anything that isn't actually keeping you alive. I'm actually very in awe of ancient technology and what people could achieve. It's such a clever, simple design. very decorative because it was simply a costume and you displayed your wealth by the quality of your armor the royal armories has moved most of its famous collection from the tower of london to a specially built museum in leeds in the north of england the new museum displays one of the greatest collections of arms and armour in the world. The master of the Royal Armouries is Guy Wilson. You and I are soft-skinned animals. Our ancestors, whether hunting dangerous prey or fighting amongst themselves, learnt early on that it was a good idea to have some sort of protection over their bodies. The furs and skins of animals, as well as providing warmth, also gave a good deal of protection against claw, tooth and weapon. But when tribal conflict turned into organized warfare, even greater protection was required. The age of armor had dawned. And ever since then, the armorer has been trying to do the impossible, to provide an effective defense against a variety of deadly weapons, and to make that protection light and flexible enough to allow the man within to move, fight, and if necessary, run away. There have been many answers to the problem. Metal armor, whether made of solid plates or interlinking rings of wire, has been one of the most long-lasting of them. But why have mail and plate proved so effective and so endearing? The popular view of a Middle Ages battlefield is that everyone wore plenty of exquisite plate and mail body armor. Survival was all about full metal protection and plenty of it. At the Royal Armouries Museum, Tom Richardson, Keeper of Armour, explains how armour works. There are essentially two strategies in armour. You either deflect things, such as swords, spears, arrows, crossbow bolts, bullets, or you absorb their impact. These medieval knights are richly and expensively covered with the finest metal protection. It is powerful images like these that have driven our romantic view of how men went to battle in the Middle Ages. In fact, the magnificent mail and plate these noble knights are wearing was only for the privileged few. Like so many other myths in history, their fine armor is only part of the story. Most ordinary soldiers went onto the medieval battlefield with very little to protect them. A few may have worn something on their heads or had a simple male garment perhaps inherited or possibly small pieces of plate armor looted from a battlefield. Most of them had no defenses whatsoever. A fair proportion had fabric defenses, garments called jacks, that is to say, quilted doublets. These garments are so fragile and, of course, almost valueless at the time, and so they simply haven't survived. 
In addition to the quilted defense that was being worn in the 15th century, these garments have little squares of iron fitted into the quilting, so they're not visible in a complete garment in good condition. But looking at this example, which looks as if it's almost completely destroyed, you can see the construction, that the plates are clearly visible, the cords holding the plates into the quilting are clearly visible. From looking at these rare surviving jacks, it is difficult to assess how useful they were on the battlefield. The problem is with the jack that we really don't know how good a defense it was. It's quite clear from ballistic testing that it's not as good in a kind of laboratory environment as uh, the highest quality Augsburg armor of plate. But in general, it was probably quite useful for keeping not particularly fierce blows or particularly powerful missiles from injuring the troops wearing them. Another sort of medieval armor was called a brigandine, a coat of metal plates covered with velvet. This is a fragment of a 16th century brigandine. It's made of small rectangular iron plates riveted inside a fabric coat covered with velvet. So all you see on the outside is a velvet coat with gilt rivets on it. Well, the nice thing about this form of defense is it's actually incredibly simple to make. You need to chop up a lot of little rectangular pieces of iron and you need to rivet them inside a coat. But those are fairly low-level skills. Armour is always a compromise between protection and inconvenience, preventing people moving weight that they need to carry around on the battlefield. And essentially, the rule is like this. You don't wear anything that isn't actually keeping you alive. And there are wonderful records in the 16th century of troops being equipped in Flanders with enormously expensive equipment. And as soon as they get out of um, sight of the person who bought all the stuff, they're, they're throwing the armed defences in the ditch because they don't want to wear it. It's not actually helping them on the battlefield. Roman commanders protected their men with the best ideas around. Even within a single army unit, the armours weren't all the same. Within limits, soldiers were allowed to embellish their equipment out of their own salary. From the Greeks came plate armor, which the Romans improved on. They later made metal armor that was jointed and constructed in sections to make movement easier. Mail, so familiar as a medieval form of protection, was also used by Roman soldiers. It may have been adapted from the ancient Iron Age tribes that had inhabited northern Europe, but of all armor, it is the most unlikely and intriguing. The idea behind mail seems to be Celtic, and <clears throat> some of the earliest finds of mail come from archaeological sites uh, in Britain, in fact. It seems to have been adopted by the Romans and to have spread east around the Mediterranean and into Asia. And the type of mail that we see here in this very late 15th century example is actually remarkably similar to the type of mail that was being produced by the Celts and the Romans. Well, it's an extraordinary thing. Here's a type of armor made entirely of holes that the principal type of defense used in European warfare for over 1,500 years. Mail was popular and widely used. It was worn both by the medieval knight and the more lowly soldier. It lasted more than 1,500 years, and there is still enough mail around now to appreciate the technical beauty of its construction. But we are only just beginning to understand how intricate that construction was. Arms in Action will return in a moment here on the History Channel. Throughout the Dark Ages, many men went to battle wearing male protection. Probably the only protection available to them, apart from a simple iron helmet. So a great deal of mail must have been made. But even from early surviving examples, it is difficult to understand how it could have been made in such quantities and so well. A long male shirt like this could weigh up to 50 pounds and would have a minimum of 45,000 individual links. Only a rich lord could afford such complete protection. Sometimes, as here, with a separate coif or hood. But the skills to make mail were never written down. 
and Simon Metcalfe from the Conservation Department of the Victoria and Albert Museum, London, has been trying to unravel the intricacies of the mail maker's lost art. I mean, the reason it's amazing is, on one level, it's such a clever, simple design. You're using very small pieces of metal, and you interlink them, and you'll get a very, very flexible armour. To begin making mail, you need wire first. There's a lot of controversy about when people started making wire. Once you've got the wire, the next thing you need to do is coil it into little springs. Uh, I use a hand mandrel for coiling the wire. There are a number of theories about making the wire. Basically, the metal has to be stretched through a series of holes in a block. There are even references to horses pulling the wire. But no evidence of wire drawing machines appears until the middle of the 14th century. The next process along is to cut them off. So you start to produce the individual links. What people did think was that this was punched out of a sheet, but it's um, a lot more complicated than people think. The next step is to overlap each link. Working at this rate, Simon Metcalf estimates that it would take something like 750 hours for one person to complete a male shirt. With so many stages involved, we have to assume that one person was responsible for each stage of the mail making process. Perhaps this is the, this is the earliest form of mass production, because there are stories of whole towns employed in making mail. The next stage in this complex procedure is to heat up the individual rings. You have to soften the rings between each process, otherwise it makes the operation of punching and riveting much more difficult and more liable to go wrong. Simon Metcalf has spent many years understanding how mail must have been made. There are some illustrations, but no detailed records for him to refer to. You need to uh, widen the area which is overlapped so you can make enough room to punch a hole through it, because all the mail is riveted up at the end. So you've made the overlapped area wider by squashing it between a pair of pliers. The next thing you need to do is punch the hole. And you use a small punch to do that. It's called drifting. It's a technical term for it. With all this research, Simon has learned a little about the skills of the people who made mail. I'm actually very in awe of ancient technology and what people could achieve. The slow, careful process of accurately piercing each separate iron ring continues until there are enough to begin the long, slow process of assembling the mail into a recognizable garment. Once you've got the link with a hole in it, you can then start constructing the shirt. The mail does vary in size, and some of it's incredibly small. And obviously, um, this makes the rivets very, very small. They're, um, they're say, two millimeters wide at the top. It makes the whole process quite well, extremely fiddly, to be honest. The final step is to cut the rivet, put it in the hole, and then close it between pliers, and that's the finished riveted shirt. The final stage would be carried out by a skilled assembler. He would link the mail together to form a close-fitting garment which carefully followed the body contours of the wearer. Mail had to fit well. If it flapped or got in the way when a man was fighting, it left him vulnerable. If it fitted well, it provided some protection against the main weapons of the day. The spear, sword, the axe, and the longbow and crossbow arrow. And the skill of the mailmaker extended beyond the making of mail shirts to the manufacture of mail helmets and mail protection for arms and legs. If you're making an armour out of plates, it's incredibly difficult to cover areas like the armpits which move around a lot and so really what they're making is a flexible metal cloth and that's the brilliant thing about it. Mail was a popular protection for over 1500 years but it had one flaw. Mail was actually useless uh, on its own. You've got to wear something underneath it for it to take effect. Usually an arming jacket was worn and as these unique tests show Against a longbow arrow, it offers some protection on its own. 
but this is not an entirely true test as the dummy behind it does not respond quite like a human body. But when the male was worn over an arming jacket, the wearer's chances improved and in some cases the arrow would bounce off. But an arrow with the right head could pierce the male and the arming jacket beneath, causing a serious injury. Uh, there are wonderful records of Spaniards uh, in the conquest of the New World um, <clears throat> poking fun at the uh, locals' obsidian-tipped arrows. So they said, well, they're not bad. They're, they're very good weapons, we find, anyway. And so they hung up some male shirts on their own, and they were able to shoot um, obsidian-tipped arrows straight through them. Now, if they were padded and on a human body, that simply wouldn't occur. Um, <clears throat> male has to be worn with some kind of padding, usually a quilted defence underneath. Male was probably never effective enough to protect against a savage bone-crushing sword blow. In fact, it was always at its best when used with other armour. Mail and plate armour combined together in one of the last remaining armours of its kind in the world. In the late 16th century, 350 pounds of armour was constructed to cover one Indian elephant. Seen by the commanders of the ancient world as heavyweight shock troops, these powerful beasts could trample tightly packed foot soldiers to death and halt a cavalry charge with their tusks and trunks. Most horses were terrified by the smell of elephants who could toss a rider and a nervous horse into the air. But although in some countries these beasts were fashionable for many centuries, no self-respecting commander would go into battle without them, they had problems on the battlefield. Expectations that their weight and strength could destroy fortified enemy positions were often unfounded. The elephant was easily halted by placing spikes on the ground because it has very sensitive feet, and it didn't take much skill to knock the driver from his perch behind the elephant's head. However, early descriptions of armored elephant battling against elephant, the tusks goring into exposed flesh, give some idea of the battlefield sound of 200 elephants fighting each other. This magnificent example of Indian mail and plate armor shows how skilled armorers were in devising protection even for this beast, the world's most unlikely fighting animal. For the Wall Street Journal. The History Channel now returns to Arms in Action. This extraordinary decorated and colorful armor, uniquely developed in Japan, was primarily designed to absorb the impact, not of the feared Japanese sword, but of arrows. Japanese armor, as Oriental specialist Ian Bottomley suggests, is deceptive. It is light and flexible and functional. Japanese armor looks rather decorative, but in practice, it's designed to give freedom of movement. Keith Ducklin, a trained Royal Armory's fight interpreter, regularly demonstrates Japanese armor and fighting techniques in the Royal Armory's Museum. This is the best way to try and test Japanese armor. My European armors weigh 85 pounds, this weighs about 50 pounds. So it is really heaven by comparison to anything uh, uh, that I tend to wear at any other time of the day. The most difficult uh, part of it is actually the helm. Uh, because the helm, as you can see, is very clumsy and it, and it has the elaborate crests on the top. So it's clumsier in some ways, um, but again, it wasn't made to do the same job as European armour, so there's a lot more freedom in that sense. It moves with you far more than, than a European armour does. Uh, I'm not sure I trust it to protect me in quite the same way, but it is a different philosophy. Like all Asiatic armors, it is in fact made of lamella, of iron and rawhide, laced together with silk braid. And together, this combination absorbs the energy of an impact or a cut before actually penetration can take place. While mail was worn in Europe, lamella armor, small plates of metal bound together, were the main defense not only in Japan, but across the whole of Asia for over a thousand years. 
Small pieces of overlapping metal or leather plates are laced together with fine leather thongs to give the horseman a flexible defense against the main Asian weapon of the time, the composite bow. Layers of silk were worn under the armor to add further protection. This kind of defense has kind of internal springs, so that anything that hits it doesn't exactly bounce off, but the kinetic energy of the impact is absorbed by all these springy materials. Armour's always designed for a particular purpose. This type of armour is designed for wear on a horse against the threat of archery. And of course the principal weapon throughout Asia for most of that period was the, the composite bow. The Mongolian horse archer was covered in a coat of flexible lamellar armour which extends to cover the back of the horse. As with all armour, it's a matter of what's most useful on the day at the time against the weapons which are around on the battlefield. This Asian lamellar armour was the main influence in the evolution of Japanese armour. Japanese culture is unique in the way it has revered and preserved arms and armour. There are deep and binding traditions, particularly those connected with the renowned samurai warrior and his distinctive armour. When you are dressing in Japanese armour, it's normal, as in European armour, to start from the feet first and work your way up to the helmet. But in conditions of war or in emergency, there are methods of getting into the armour very quickly one of the simplest being to hang it up by a rope and dive up from underneath it and emerging through the armor holes. It's probably effective as solid plate armor, but in a totally different kind of way. It, it resembles, in fact, some of the modern lamellar armors used in things like bulletproof vests and for armor on tanks. Like his European counterpart, the samurai warrior placed great importance on what was worn under his armor. Soft materials were worn next to the skin to increase the armor's ability to absorb cuts and blows. If the samurai warrior was very wealthy, he would wear full, sumptuous court dress under his armor as a mark of his rank and social position. But not all samurai were wealthy. Many used whatever material was at hand wearing several tightly wrapped layers of a cheap and practical material such as hemp under their armor. During Japan's early history, armor was very much the prerogative of the rich, although their retainers wore a very simple kind of armor. But during the 16th century, during the prolonged and very vicious civil wars, all classes of fighting men wore armor, from the very rich to the very poorest peasants who were recruited as matchlock men. By the late 16th century, Japanese warfare shared many similarities with Western battle practice. They used matchlock guns, their famous swords, and had cavalry and artillery, and wore mail and plate. During the long Age of War, which was a series of violent internal feuds, the country had been torn apart by bitter and violent warring factions. When the violence subsided, Japan enjoyed a period of peace and seclusion from the outside world for 250 years. But despite these peaceful times, owning impressive armor was still an essential status symbol. During the later period of peace, which continued until the 1850s, 1860s, um, once again, armor became very decorative because it was simply a costume and you displayed your wealth by the quality of your armor. The Japanese samurai warrior, though exalted, was rarely rich enough to buy his own complete set of armor. So he collected it, piece by piece, over his lifetime. As each piece was purchased, it would be carefully decorated and lacquered. The samurai wanted to be noticed on the battlefield. The more extravagant the colors, the more individual the design, the more the samurai warrior stood out. Japanese armor was originally devised for use by mounted horsemen. And such features as the large shoulder guards, which replaced shields, are one of its characteristic features. The Japanese helmet is also sumptuously and exotically decorated. But like the armor, it is also designed for a practical protective purpose. 
although the helmet and mask look rather grotesque to us, one of the main functions of the mask was to simply act as an attachment point for the helmet cords, which if you tied it under your chin tended to loosen, but if you tie it onto the mask, it allows you to tie it very tightly to your face. The helmets on Japanese armour look peculiar to our eyes, but again they were devised initially for use by mounted archers. And the turn backs at the edges of the neck guard originally acted to protect the face from arrows coming from the opposition. Japanese arms and armour are elaborate and unique. They defined the warrior's individuality and it reflected the reverence the Japanese have always had for their arms and armor and for the special role the warrior has had in their culture. Arms in Action will return in a moment here on the History Channel. This Greek soldier, a hoplite, is dressed as he would have been around 600 BC, from head to foot in bronze plate, molded to the shape of his body. In most cities, the hoplite had to provide his own armor, which was expensive. So hoplite soldiers came from the wealthier classes. Armor was intended to protect vulnerable spots, and a warrior's head was his most vulnerable target. The front of the skull is relatively tough, but a blow just above the jawbone can break the skull even if it's delivered by a strong child with a big stick. So helmets have always been important. Many of them have been intended not merely to protect the skull, but also to offer protection to the face, where a blow can so easily blind, and also to do something about the veins and arteries of the neck. For all its simplicity, this original Corinthian helmet of around 600 BC is a beautifully crafted object made from a single plate of bronze. This rare Saxon helmet is made of iron. Iron is a difficult material to work in large pieces. Early iron helmets were made in small sections jointed together as this replica Saxon helmet shows. Helmets made from a single plate of iron appeared later as skills and technology improved. The challenge for the modern armourer is to make a helmet using the old methods. The essential feature of a good quality medieval or Renaissance helmet is that the skull was made from one single piece of metal. Nowadays the standard technique is to weld the helmet in two halves. If it's well done you can't tell the difference, but it's not right. The real art we have to preserve is to form these things as they were made in medieval times from the single sheet. There's no other way to do it. You just, you simply can't get the medieval feel if you use 20th century techniques. It doesn't work. They neither feel right nor look right. What you have here is an authentic medieval product. The medieval craftsmen were very extremely clever, skilled people. If they had written down what they knew, then life would be a lot simpler nowadays, but they didn't. It was a, a fairly closely guarded secret. You have to relearn the whole series of medieval techniques, but the art of shaping a, a single plate into a piece of armor, which after all is a, a work of art and a, a working machine at the same time, that is very difficult. You just have to work it out for yourself. The area around the face, at the front of the helmet, is marked with chalk before it is cut out to give the helmet its intended shape. The whole process will take about three working days to complete. This type of helmet, the salad, was common in Europe in the 15th century. Inside was a padded fabric lining to absorb the blows, like the inside of a modern crash helmet. This helmet, also a salad, is a considerable improvement, 
with a visor to see through so more of the face and the neck is protected. But more importantly, the most vulnerable part of the body, the skull. Remarkable forensic research has uncovered the horrifying story behind Britain's bloodiest battle fought in 1461. The researchers, using the latest sound probing technology, have discovered the bodies of some of the many men who are said to have died in the Battle of Towton, fought on this misty landscape. The battlefield at Towton dates from the War of the Roses, which is a 15th century battle. It was fought on Palm Sunday in 1461, where apparently between 50,000 and 100,000 troops met on the hills surrounding us here and the engagement is supposed to have lasted between six and ten hours. In that time, there were supposed to be 28,000 people killed. Now, how accurate that is, is difficult to judge, but one thing we can assume is that there are a vast number of people buried in this landscape. Illustrations from the period show armies locked in combat. There are walls of dead bodies piled high. Carnage like this had never been seen before on an English battlefield especially not when Englishmen was fighting Englishmen. The scientists use sound waves to find the bodies. The remains are then carefully exhumed. We're looking for mass graves, which can hopefully tell us more about the battlefield itself. So far, there is very limited evidence. There is historic documents from the period, but they are very limited in number, and what they actually tell us about the battle is very limited as well. The skulls they have found tell a shocking and horrible story with evidence of deep penetrating wounds. Project leader Anthea Boston explains their significance. The most interesting find was the number of cranial injuries that the victims had sustained. We'd thought previously that soldiers wore helmets at this period and so we were quite surprised that these ones obviously weren't wearing helmets. Many of them had been sustained to the back of their head some of them were healed, which means they must have been sustained in previous battles. The importance of this find is it's the first time we've had the opportunity to investigate the casualties of a British battle. This is how a 15th century artist tried to capture the grim reality of the medieval battlefield. The pile of dead and wounded after the Battle of Towton were said to have caused the rivers in the area to run red with blood. We're using in a number of new techniques within this area to locate mass graves and the area of the battlefield itself. All of these techniques are non-invasive. They will not disturb the ground at all, apart from the fact that we're walking over it in a logical manner, mapping every metre. Locating exactly where the bodies are buried in the landscape is only the beginning of the research team's work. When we excavated the graves, most of the skulls were in a fragmentary condition and they probably would have been broken to pieces before they were laid in the ground. And it was only in the laboratory that we managed to piece them back together again. The Wars of the Roses set Englishman against Englishman, sometimes neighbor against neighbor. This was no war on a foreign field, but a 30-year-long violent civil war fought for the crown of England. We know they were using sharp weapons like swords and daggers, and those injuries are quite different from the blunt type of injuries inflicted by something like the spike of a poleaxe. Some of them had been hit in the face, not only once, but on repeated occasions. And to stand opposite someone and inflict those kind of injuries suggests very brutal warfare, as opposed to the kind of chivalrous idea we've had in the past of knights with lances jousting in conflict. Not the age of chivalry we've been led to believe. After many battles and thousands of deaths, it seems that many soldiers were without the armoured protection portrayed by the artists of the day. As armies increased, the enormous expense of equipping them with armour became prohibitive. 
Despite more accurate firearms and artillery that could kill and wound with shot and exploding shell, soldiers went into battle with only the uniform they wore to protect them. For quite a long time, soldiers wore nothing particularly solid by way of headgear. They went to war in 1914, by and large, wearing caps or shakos. But the casualties in the first year of the war meant that the helmet was reinvented. And it followed a peculiarly national line. The British wore a rimmed helmet, the battle bowler as it was nicknamed, which looked rather like the kettle hat of medieval times. The Germans wore something like this, which looked almost like a medieval salad worn 450 years before the First World War. The return of the armoured helmet in the First World War was a lesson learned at considerable cost. A lesson earlier commanders had themselves learned the hard way. The importance of properly protecting their men in battle. Arms in Action, will re the History Channel now returns to Arms in Action. Medieval armor was all about achieving a balance between mobility and protection. Protection against the primary weapons of the day, the sword, the axe, the lance, and arrows. Wearing a complete suit of plate armor was only in vogue for about 200 years, and was only worn in a small area of the world, Europe. Medieval armourers were precise and accurate shaping the armour to fit the body exactly. An expensive suit of armour could be made from 200 separate pieces. Mail was worn with plate armour to protect the areas that plate didn't or couldn't cover. Although mail was never as close fitting. A long mail skirt protecting the legs flapped around and hindered movement. One 11th century commander had been called Emma by his men because his male skirt was so long. The armor is attached with a number of laces or straps and buckles. The idea is to spread the weight of the armor all over the body so the wearer is properly balanced and mobile. The parts are hinged, laced, buckled and clipped together and the whole is worn over a padded arming jacket to absorb blows to the body. This armor is a replica of a 15th century Italian armor. Its smooth, polished surfaces will deflect attacking weapons. The armor is worn by one of the Royal Armouries Museum's interpreters, Adam de Forge. He describes what it is like to wear plate metal armor. Well, the protective qualities of the armor uh, depend largely on uh, attack coming from the front. So if I close myself off, you can see there are relatively few targets. Uh, the trouble being that if you open your arms out or lift your arms up into the air, then the areas which are covered by mail become vulnerable. Some plate armor was capable of resisting longbow arrows, as these slow motion tests demonstrate. But the missile's impact would be felt by the body, and several hits on the knight's breastplate could halt his advance. The wooden crossbow was also common on the medieval battlefield. But it seems even their steel-tipped bolts could not always penetrate thick plate armor. Another test with a much more powerful steel crossbow, which has to be spanned with a windlass, again showed, perhaps surprisingly, the resilience of plate armor. The medieval knight probably felt fairly secure in his suit of armor on the battlefield, even when he had to face longbows and crossbows. But the price of all this protection was the weight of the armor he had to carry around. This one, I think, is uh, about 70 pounds, plus the mail on the top of that, so all this mail adds more weight. Uh, with regard to hot, how hot is it? Uh, the thing is with the armor, there's nowhere for the hot air to go. So the hot air in underneath the armor tends to build up and build up and build up. So you get a sort of a sauna effect in that the hot air then heats you up, you heat up the air. But it, the, the jacket underneath is designed to absorb all that sort of uh, the moisture that comes off of your body. So that in turn acts something like a wetsuit. So it keeps you quite cool in actual fact. So once the jacket has become wet, that moisture keeps you fairly cool. 
but it is in fact surprising what a knight in 70 pounds of mail and plate can do, as this demonstration shows. If you can't move around in it, it's no good. So all those stories of fallen knights unable to get back on their feet after falling to the ground are the stuff of myth. You wouldn't want to go into a combat situation wearing armor that you felt was so restrictive that you wouldn't be able to defend yourself. And indeed, the medieval knight would have his armor tailor-made for him, which could be a very expensive business, of course. Because plate armor was expensive and the preserve of the privileged knights, it was common practice for poorer soldiers to loot armor in the aftermath of the battle. Dead bodies were stripped and the armor sold on or kept and worn. Some of what we know about early medieval armor comes from the bodies of those who were buried in their armor. Perhaps their wounds and rotting bodies proved too much for the looters to handle. Armor makes good sense, at least in theory, for it helps protect its wearer from death and injury. But often it became too heavy or too expensive, like plate armor, or simply failed to give protection against all the risks on the battlefield. The gun had, at last, it seemed, conquered armor and with it the battlefield. The inefficient and inaccurate handgun of the 14th century had developed into the reliable matchlock, which was now dominating the battlefields of Europe with withering volley fire. By the 17th century, matchlock muskets like these could punch big holes through plate metal. Plate armor had had its day. There was a constant duel between the armorer and those who were attacking armor. As missiles got better and bullets flew faster, so armor got more heavy and became more difficult to wear. But as soon as armor seems finished, it creeps back in again. For protection against bullets, modern armor now looks for inspiration to the softer fabric materials that had once been the only protection of the foot soldier of medieval times with his quilted jacket. Today, soldiers are protected with a combination of natural absorbent fabrics that have been used throughout history with built-in layers of the latest synthetic fibers. Some of these new materials are five times stronger than steel wire and give the modern infantryman ultra lightweight protection and good mobility. These new materials are capable of stopping a 38 caliber round at three feet. The medieval armorers had been confident that their armor would withstand the impact of a sword slash and the penetrating arrow. And for a time it did. For a period of about 300 years, soldiers went to war with no protection at all. Many died from wounds that could have been prevented with basic body defenses. Far less than the metal encased medieval knight. Plate defenses were only ever one of the options available to the armorer. And even in its decline, armor never went completely out of use. To us, it seems incredible that even at the beginning of the 20th century, soldiers should be expected to fight without defenses. Ignoring the lessons of our earlier history, where the armorer's ingenuity could determine whether a man lived or died on the battlefield. So today, especially now that we increasingly rely upon smaller numbers of more highly trained people to defend us, whether they be in the army or the police, most of those are usually equipped both with helmets and body armor. The wheel has come full circle. <laughs>